Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Catherine McLean, a tobacco researcher at George Mason University. TOPS is organized by Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, Mike Pesco at Georgia State University, and me. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and the discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pasco from Georgia State University. Today, we conclude our spring 2023 season with a single paper presentation by Russell Leonard entitled, Do Vertical ID Laws Curb Teenage Drinking and Smoking? A Reconsideration. Before introducing our speaker today, we have a few administrative announcements. First, today's presentation marks the end of the 2023 spring season. If you are interested in presenting for the next season, please submit a proposal through the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org, by Monday, June 5th, to be considered for the upcoming season. Today's presentation marks TOPS, 20, TOPS 66th presentation since its first in September 2020. Organizers have worked hard to make TOPS a premier destination for presenting research with tobacco policy implications and using study designs capable of producing results with the causal interpretation. We appreciate all researchers that have presented for TOPS and all discussants and audience members that have contributed thoughtful discussion. The high quality of these presentations and discussion has helped to drive an average audience of 180 people per seminar. We thank all for being part of this journey with us in breaking silos in tobacco policy research and providing a platform for high quality research to be discussed and disseminated. As we approach the three year mark, we find ourselves at a significant milestone, our first leadership transition. Today, we express our heartfelt gratitude to two extraordinary individuals who have been instrumental in top since its inception. Doctors Catherine McLean and Justin White who are founders and executive board members of TOPS. These individuals are stepping down from their leadership positions though they will continue to contribute to TOPS and other capacities going forward. Please join me in a special moment as we ask Catherine and Justin to turn on their cameras. We have prepared a surprise presentation of a plaque to honor their exemplary service and leadership. Thank you. Uh, I'm bored of my background. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. This is very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for thank you for again for everything that you've done to make Tops uh, so successful. And now I will thank you. And now I will introduce today's oh apologies. Um, while Catherine and Justin's shoes will be difficult to fill, I am thrilled to introduce our two new. Uh, incoming executive board members, Dr. Jamie Hartman Boyce, who is transitioning from Oxford University to University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and Dr. Michael Darden of Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Uh, Jamie Hartman Boyce uses evidence synthesis to inform policy and practice regarding tobacco control interventions and novel tobacco products. Dr. Michael Darden uses structural econometric techniques to model intertemporal health and utility trade-offs associated with tobacco products. Welcome aboard, Jamie and Michael, and thanks in advance for your contributions. And now I will introduce today's speaker. Russell Leonard is a graduate student in economics at the University of California, Irvine, and an affiliate of the Center for Health Economics and Policy Studies at San Diego State University. His intended research fields fall within applied microeconomics, and his current research involves teen substance use policy in the urban rural broadband internet gap. Dr. Joseph Sabia, professor of economics at San Diego State University, is a co-author of the study and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Justin White from University of California, San Francisco. Russell Leonard, thank you for presenting for us today. All right, thanks a lot. 
Okay, so uh, I'm excited to share with you guys today uh, and everyone that is here uh, some research that I've done joint with uh, Joe Sabia down at SDSU. Uh, and today the topic of conversation is whether or not vertical ID laws curb teen drinking and smoking. So for disclosures, uh, the funding source for this presented work uh, comes from the Center for Health Economics and Policy Studies at SDSU, uh, which does receive funding from the Troche Family Foundation and the Charles Koch Foundation. Uh, for starters, we want to really drive in the point that alcohol misuse is very costly. 140,000 Americans die annually from alcohol-related causes. Uh, the healthcare-related uh, workforce, crime, traffic accident, cost-related uh, costs of alcohol are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, there are also external costs on others as opposed to just the users. Um, it's been a national objective since 1979 of the CDC's Healthy People. Uh, and a lot of these costs of misuse uh, are generated by teenagers and uh, young adults who are, are not very experienced using alcohol. Uh, so to name a few of these, we can say that 10% of teens report drinking and driving. Uh, one teenager dies from drunk driving every 15 minutes. Uh, in total, the, the social costs of just teenage alcohol misuse is around $30 billion per year. Um, Indeed, uh, studies do show that teenage drinking specifically is linked to other uh, specific costs, right? So diminished academic performance, uh, school violence, crime, both petty and serious, uh, risky sexual behaviors and unwanted pregnancy, as well as gateway use to harder substances. Uh, and these, again, also often generate both internal and external costs. And some other outcomes uh, of, that are related to this might be difficult to measure, like uh, productivity loss from hangovers or things like that. There's also some recent descriptive evidence that talks about uh, uh, how early drinking uh, initiation can lead to problem drinking later on. It's sort of interesting to think that uh, we don't really talk about alcohol uh, and its problems a lot as a society. Sometimes it's uh, sort of just chalked up as being a norm, but if you look at this map, uh, this is from 2019, but still you could say that it's it's pretty shocking that we can sort of talk about the impacts of alcohol and the dangers of alcohol to be on an even a similar level as opioids in the recent opioid crisis of years. So, and then beyond that at the bottom, we have that alcohol does have links to serious health problems like cardiovascular disease, cancer, immune suppression, suicide. What does this mean? Again, it means that any public policies that affect alcohol misuse, especially among teens and young adults, even a little bit, is likely to generate important social benefits or costs worthy of studies. So there are going to be waves and ripples made by any policy that specifically targets uh, youth substance abuse, specifically alcohol here. Uh, and there's, there's really strong evidence that the minimum legal drinking age and zero tolerance drunk driving laws actually do really affect uh, drinking behaviors. But as far as some of the other policies that have been enacted in the past couple of decades, uh, there's really uh, much more mixed evidence on their effectiveness. Uh, moving on to, we have cigarettes and e-cigarettes as well, and there, there's been a documented decline in youth cigarette smoking in recent decades, but there's also been this boom in electronic cigarette markets. So uh, we want to say that policy measures that could affect either market are going to be extremely, extremely relevant uh, due to some, some costs that we can discuss here. In a minute. But here are just the national trends from the National Youth Tobacco Survey and cigarette and e-cigarette use. So again, we see a, a, a sharp increase in, in e-cigarette use and a, a, a gradual decline in cigarette use. And youth cigarette use is also very costly. 480,000 Americans die annually from combustible tobacco-related causes. Uh, Tobacco-related il tobacco illnesses cost the US $240 billion a year in direct public health costs. Uh, teen cigarette smoking is very highly correlated with continued adult use. So getting addicted to cigarettes and nicotine as uh, youth is very, very likely to lead to prolonged adult use. Uh, and some recent evidence suggests that uh, stricter youth tobacco policy can substantially reduce the probability of adult use. So again, uh, thoughtful policy uh, regarding underage cigarette use is very important. That brings us to the topic of today, and that is vertical ID laws, or as I will call them sometimes, VILs. Uh, what do they do? They mandate that minors who are below 21 years old, uh, when they receive a state ID card or a driver's license, uh, 
uh, it's got to be vertically oriented, similar to the lower picture on the right hand side, uh, as opposed to a horizontally oriented ID card on the uh, on the top on the right hand side. So these have now been adopted in all 50 states and the District of Columbia uh, with with two real goals. So the first goal is to facilitate the ease of age verification for age restricted substance purchase. So uh, the goal is really just to say if some some teenager walks into a convenience store and tries to buy a pack of cigarettes with their vertical ID, uh, the goal is that the clerk will kind of take a look at it and know to take a much closer look at the age, the expiration date, uh, the photo. Uh, that's the, the main goal, right? And then the secondary sort of goal is that uh, it's going to reduce the supply of passable false ID cards that minors might obtain from their peers. So it's it's going to make it harder for for kids to be able to find someone that looks like them who is 21 years of age, uh, who they can pass off that person's ID as their own and therefore pass themselves off as being of age. So some specific talks about what the actual mechanisms are, right? So this is pretty important. And if this comes up uh, in questions later, then I'm, I'm happy to go through this a little bit more. Um, so first off, there's a, a lower probability that a minor can purchase a, these age-restricted products by confidently, I would say, uh, presenting their own real personal ID card to a clerk who misreads it, right? So again, in this case, we're talking about a reduced probability of success in some sort of instance where a teenager walks up to the counter and says, here's my real ID that says that I'm 16 years old. Uh, please sell me a bottle of vodka. Uh, the vertical ID, it's going to make people take a closer look at the ID. Uh, they know that the vertical orientation means that the, the person, there's a higher probability the person is underage. So they're going to look at the ID, see that it's vertical, take a closer look at it and deny the sale. That's the first mechanism. The second mechanism is that there's going to be a lower probability that a minor can get away with using somebody else's ID uh, that is of age to buy alcohol or tobacco. So through a similar, a similar sort of uh, process, the, the high school student might walk up using their cousin Billy's ID, Billy's 23, and then the vertical orientation will cause the clerk to say, take a closer look at it, say, hey, this picture doesn't really look like you. It doesn't, you're not six foot two, uh, and then sort of make that connection and then deny the sale. So just to be really clear, uh, here's a couple of examples of, uh, of how these mechanisms would work in action. So, uh, so for mechanism one, we're passing off uh, your own ID as if you're of age, right? So we can say minor A in a non-BIL state is gonna successfully make a purchase using their own horizontal ID card because the seller is not queued in to take a closer look at it and they just, mi they just mix up the dates and then they make the sale, okay? So this is a non-BIL state. Then minor B in a VIL state would fail a similar purchase because their vertically oriented ID is going to prompt the seller to take a closer look, uh, check the dates more correctly and deny the sale. Uh, mechanism two has a couple of ways that it can work, right? So we've got minor C say in a non-VIL state and they're going to successfully buy beer using the real unexpired horizontal, horizontally oriented ID of some 21 year old peer, cousin Billy. Uh, Whereas minor D in a VIL state would fail this similar purchase if the uh, cousin Billy ID that they present is vertically oriented and is going to kind of, again, uh, tip off the cashier that they need to really evaluate the sale more closely. Uh, further, we could think about minor E uh, in a VIL state who's gonna fail to find a passable ID from anyone in general, right? So they don't have a cousin Billy, uh, they're a 16 year old, they don't have many 21 year old peers, uh, and then the additional imposition that now uh, they really have pressure to find a horizontally oriented ID instead of a vertically oriented ID is going to cause them to, to fail to find a uh, passable false ID. So there are a couple of reasons that we think that the VIL induced reductions in these youth purchases might be small. So for one, uh, if minors aren't frequently using their own IDs to buy, preventing these sorts of purchases is not going to significantly affect the consumption. So if uh, talking about mechanism one, where they use their own ID, if this is not happening frequently, then even if we carve out all of those purchases, this is not going to have a groundbreaking effect on the youth consumption. Uh, 
Second of all, if the VILs, uh, the VILs themselves are going to be the most effective when they represent a sharp cutoff between minors and of age consumers, right? So when I say a sharp cutoff, uh, that means that uh, ID cards issued to minors are going to expire at 21, which is going to prevent uh, maybe someone that turns 21 from giving their now uh, of age ID to uh, maybe their little cousin once uh, they go in and they turn in their ID and, or they don't turn in their ID once they turn 21 and get their horizontal ID. Uh, and also a, another example of a sharp, uh, sharp cutoff policy would be if a state just uh, bans sales to vertical IDs in general, expired or not. So if you try to purchase alcohol using a vertical ID in some state, uh, then it's just not allowed. So going to point one, sort of, uh, we think that these reductions might be small because the statistics don't really suggest that these sorts of purchases are common. So uh, just the table on the right-hand side I have here, this is the pre-treatment, so the pre-VIL means uh, for the adopting states uh, for alcohol and cigarette own purchase. So a couple of things to note here, uh, own purchase doesn't specify the type of ID used or not used to make a purchase. This is just, this just asks, asks uh, high school students, uh, when you how did when you last got alcohol how did you obtain it and then this is them saying i bought it in a store by myself it doesn't say that they used a false id used their own id used a manufactured fake they weren't carded uh, but we see that for these types of purchases we're looking at uh, for 16 year olds two and a half percent of 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 obtainment and for 17 year olds about four percent of obtainment and so we can think of this as a, a kind of a strict upper bound for the the possible uh reductions that we could have by carving out uh, just uh, own purchases using uh, a passable false ID or boldly using your own ID. And uh, this is sort of similar for cigarettes, uh, although we can imagine that uh, a, a lot of clerks are maybe more likely to uh, be more lenient on cigarette sales than alcohol sales due to DUI related concerns or something like that. So, so that the bottom row shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, further, uh, we don't think that these sharp cutoffs exist everywhere in the country, right? So here we have uh, something from the Arizona Liquor Control Board that was effective in 2016 uh, that says that liquor licensed businesses in Arizona, they're not allowed to accept vertically oriented Arizona IDs, uh, but they're still allowed to accept uh, identification, vertically oriented ID cards, driver's licenses from other states. So that could be, you know, a ton of college students uh, that go to college in Arizona and have vertical IDs from other states. Uh, this is going to increase the amount of ambiguity around who's who's 21, who's not 21, uh, and this is not going to represent a sharp cutoff. And this is the case for a lot of states uh, around around the country. So, turning to the existing literature on the VALs, uh, there's a 2013 study by Ballou and Bot using the national YRBS from uh, 1991 to 2009 uh, in a two-way fixed effects approach. Uh, it's gonna be similar to ours. Uh, and they find that VALs are associated with among 16 year olds on average about a 10% decline uh, in teen drinking and teen smoking, so 16 year olds. Uh, they also find that uh, VALs may have reduced the probability that uh, of teens buying cigarettes in a store. So uh, just taking those findings at face value, it, it may have been the case that VILs improved alcohol and tobacco related public health at a very low cost. Uh, the, when Michigan implemented their VIL, a uh, state Senate analysis uh, estimated a one-time conversion cost of about a million dollars. So pretty cheap for, you know, maybe we're talking about the billions of dollars in public health savings. Uh, further, there's a, uh, research uh, from 2021 by Nesson and Tresta uh, that was looking more specifically at the uh, scanner ID laws, but also uh, looked at vertical ID laws as they affect, as they might affect uh, alcohol related traffic fatalities. Uh, and they didn't find any, any significant effects. So, so if the VILs do affect teen drinking, uh, we don't see any downstream effects uh, of, of them reducing traffic fatalities. So, what are our contributions? What are, what are we going to do in this paper? Uh, so, well, we're among the first studies to examine the effects of VILs on youth underage consumption. Um, we're gonna replicate the work of Ballou and Bot using the 1991 uh, through 2009 national YRBS. Then we're going to bring in the state youth risky behavior survey, uh, which features the same questions and measures. Uh, it's gonna have 
on average much larger sample sizes. Uh, and also the weighted samples are gonna be representative at the state level as well as the national level. Uh, and this is gonna be really important for measuring state level policy because this survey is designed to measure state level trends uh, with uh, much more accuracy. So then we'll extend the study period to 2019, uh, and then we're actually gonna combine the data sets together to maximize the amount of identifying variation you can get from states. Uh, this is gonna allow 16 additional states plus DC to contribute to the identification. Uh, and when we're looking at this fully uh, augmented and combined uh, 2019 sample, we're gonna have 47 states that contribute at least six years of post-treatment data. And uh, the vast majority will contribute closer to eight to 10 years of post-treatment data. Uh, then we'll also bring in a couple of the dynamic difference and difference estimates. Uh, so we'll use some uh, event studies using the Cowain Santana estimator uh, to address some of the new literature and difference and differences. Uh, we're also going to look at a couple of intensive use measures uh, like binge drinking, frequent smoking, everyday smoking. Uh, and we'll also try and explore a little bit of the mechanisms using novel data on teen sources of alcohol. And now I think it's a great time to pause for questions. Uh, if anyone's confused about mechanisms or things like that, I think that would be a great thing to discuss as well. Thanks, Russell. Um, first, I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to our discussant, but if you have any questions for Russell at this stage, please enter them into the Q&A. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe just two quick questions at, at this stage. Um, so one is that you mentioned that these sharp cutoffs uh, might make the vertical ID laws more effective. And I'm just curious in how many states do the vertical IDs uh, expire when, when the person turns 21? Is that pretty common? Uh, I think it's fairly common. I don't have an exact number for you, but I can, I can give you a couple of examples, right? So uh, I have a classmate from Texas who is 22, 23, and his vertical ID that he received when he was a teenager is good for another like three or four years. Um, and similarly, my girlfriend has a California ID. She's 25. Uh, and it just now it recently expired her vertical ID. So it's been, you know, in 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 legal circulation with her for an extra four years. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, because that, that would obviously complicate um compliance, I think, a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, also curious uh if you know, well, what what is known about uh how often retailers comply with the law and, and check IDs um during tobacco and alcohol purchases and also, if you know anything about relatedly about uh, enforcement of the policies, like does that vary much from state to state? Do you, do you have any idea? Uh, what do you mean by enforcement? Uh, so checking IDs. So you know, if if retailers aren't checking IDs, um, to, uh, then you know the vertical ID laws would would obviously not be expected to have much impact. Yeah, I haven't taken a look at the enforcement data recently, um, but I do know that they they run all, all sorts of stings in different different state liquor commissions run stings where they, they send in maybe like a cop's kid or something with an, with their own ID to try and get uh, the retailer to sell to them using their own ID. Um, and, and then they, they do keep data on that. So that's something I should probably take a look at. Yeah, I, I think I've asked this before um, and I, I've never sort of seen systematic data on it, it, it seems like um, an opportunity for some enterprising researcher to, to sort of dig in more into compliance and enforcement. So um, Mike, yeah, I think that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, uh, there's, I see uh, uh, you're a co-author, um, uh, uh, Dr. Sabia is uh, answering questions in the Q&A. There's one outstanding that uh, uh, is quite interesting. I'll read it aloud here. Um, I might have missed this, but is any of this sales to minors data from a rural area? I live in rural Northern California and have worked in the field on a grant to conduct sting operations using underage youth with vertical IDs. And the clerk still sold to the youth at a rate of 59% in the first year of the grant. I, I ask just because policy can sometimes be implemented uh, differently in rural versus urban areas. That's really helpful. Um, so our data come from you know, nationwide surveys. So I imagine that a lot of the data come from rural areas, um, but it is, it is interesting to think about sending minors in with vertical IDs with a, a, a successful purchase rate of 59%. That's, that's really shocking and, uh, and really high. So that uh, does leave room for the VIL to be, to maybe be pretty effective. So we'll, we'll see. Um, would, and uh, this is one of my own questions, um, but um, would there be any um, usefulness too to thinking about 
who typically I guess I could guess who typically purchases these these products is is underage people and and I believe there's some evidence to suggest males are oftentimes the ones going into the the stores to try to buy underage right um so I wonder if you could see any kind of heterogeneous effects among males versus uh, females um and um I yeah I guess that I can't remember my other point but that's my my first question uh yeah I think I've got a slide on that coming up okay great and um let's see also um and did I did you I can't remember if you uh, discuss what outcomes you look at, but do, are you planning to look at e-cigarettes as an outcome in this uh, a study as well, or do e-cigarettes kind of take off later after a lot of these vertical ID laws came into place? So we have not looked at uh, at e-cigarettes specifically in this study. Uh, they start show that question starts showing up in the YRBS in 2015. So we have three waves of e-cigarette questions. Um, and most of the states have adopted by about 2015. So that really only leaves, uh, I think, three or four states that adopt between 2015 and 2019. So I really should probably have a, a slide or like a, a quick table on that, but I, I don't have one here today. Okay. okay. And I remember my other point. Um, how many uh, youth have IDs? Uh, do we know? Because I mentioned there's a sizable share of um, of teenagers that don't get driver's licenses. And I suppose they could go get a state ID, but they might not do that until they maybe go to college. Um, uh, and so sh should we be thinking of your estimates coming up as like intention to treat effects in the sense that, um, you know, some share of the youth don't have um, uh, IDs and so wouldn't be affected by the vertical ID laws? Uh, that's a good question too. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have data on how many students actually have IDs. Um, Think okay. That okay. All right. Great. All right. Well, I think the Q and A is cleared, so please continue with your interesting presentation. All right. Cool. Thanks very much, and thanks for these uh, useful, uh, helpful uh, comments and questions. So, um, moving right along, let's talk about the data that we're going to look at here today. Uh, so we've got the national and the state youth risky behavior surveys. Uh, we're going to look primarily at sixteen-year-olds uh, for a couple key reasons. Right. Uh, this is the group that we think is going to be directly affected. Uh, while maybe the treated 17 and 18 year olds uh, uh, may have time to adjust their behavior. So say that the vertical ID law kicks in in 2011, we're looking at uh, 16 year olds in 2011, 2013, 2015, and we're not looking at the 17 and 18 year olds uh, that may have been treated. So if they received their ID in 2011, uh, we're not gonna look at them again in 2013 when they're 17 or 18, because we think that they may have had time to kind of adjust to this new policy and learn ways to get around the system a little bit. So we think if we're gonna pick up any, any strong effects, it's gonna be with 16 year olds. Um, and so it's also important to remember that the pre-treatment cohorts of 16 year olds, so with the 2011 example, uh, a 16 year old in 2010 is not gonna receive a vertical ID. They're gonna receive horizontal IDs. Uh, so back to the YRBS, as, as many of you might know, it's a repeated cross-sectional biennial high school-based survey regarding teens' risky behaviors, which includes alcohol and tobacco use. Uh, so it's, it's administered in odd-numbered years, uh, and the students take the survey in high school, like in school. Uh, there are two different versions of it. The national YRBS is administered nationally by the CDC. And again, it's designed to be representative of national trends uh, for their own data. Then the state YRBS is almost an identical survey, but it's generally administered by state uh, health and education departments. Uh, and it, it's, we weight it so that it's representative. Uh, the state, each state sample is representative of the relevant state population. And then when looked at as a whole, that sample is going to be representative of the national relevant population of, say, 16-year-olds. Next, we're going to create an augmented YRBS to maximize the identifying variation. I've got a couple of maps that might help you uh, visualize that. So some, some states offer identifying variation solely in the state YRBS or solely in the national. Uh, and, and so when we say identifying variation, we're talking about uh, states that give pre-treatment data and post-treatment data for us to try and determine the treatment effect. So the augmented YRBS is going to consist uh, of the state YRBS and then in the state we call them state waves. So in the, the years that certain states aren't in the state YRBS, if we have national YRBS data, we're going to put those in there. And that's going to try and give us uh, the largest amount of identifying variation that we can get. Uh, we also have a, another specification where we just stick the two together. Uh, it's not going to change the result too much. 
Uh, and similar approaches to uh, this uh, combining these, these data sets and weighting them accordingly have been taken in other YRBS based studies uh, analyzing state level policies. So here I've got a quick look at the dependent variable means. So uh, this is for the whole sample period 1991 to 2019. Uh, and we see that the drinking numbers are pretty high at 43% of the national YRBS, about 40% really across all surveys. Uh, binge drinking also uh, sort of scarily high at about 20, 25% in both surveys. And then smoking participation also at about 20%. Um, here we've got the trends in our data of alcohol and cigarette use. So they have been on the decline, but uh, they're still at some pretty significant numbers, especially for drinking. Uh, still at above, you know, 25% in the 2019 sample. Uh, and this is from our augmented YRBS. We're going to take a, a two-way fixed effects regression approach. So here's our model. So Y will be one of the outcomes that's listed on that prior slide. Um, VIL is going to be a difference in difference indicator for whether state S has enacted a VIL by state by year T. Uh, then X is gonna be our big matrix of controls. Uh, so the first one is the baseline. That's gonna be the same controls used by the Baloo and Bot 2013 paper. Uh, it's gonna include uh, you know, driver's license related programs, uh, smoking and drinking kind of youth, youth related uh, policies, you know, cigarette and beer taxes, as well as some macroeconomic controls like uh, unemployment and median, median income. Uh, then when we extend the period through 2019, we add in what we call like expanded state level controls, which are some more recent policies, which involve e-cigarette taxes, scanner ID laws, keg registrations, uh, minimum legal purchasing age of 21 for all tobacco products, uh, tobacco 21 uh, from a couple of years ago. And then we've also, of course, got uh, state and year fixed effects, uh, where we call our year fixed effects wave fixed effects because uh, the YRBS comes out in these, uh, these biannual waves. We're also going to include a couple of descriptive tests to test our identification assumption with this two way fixed effects research design. Uh, the key assumption here is uh, we need parallel trends in our treated and untreated groups. So, uh, for a descriptive visual test of this, we have some classic two way fixed effects event studies. Uh, this is going to allow for a, a visual test uh, to make sure that we're not seeing any, any highly non parallel trends. Uh, we're also going to explore controls for spatial heterogeneity using some state-specific linear quadratic time trends. Uh, this is also following uh, the work done by Balloon Bot. Uh, finally, we also have event studies using the Calway and Santana estimators. Uh, that you know, there's this recent difference in difference literature that was very popular in the past couple of years, talking about how uh, two-way fixed effects estimator can produce biased estimates in the presence of heterogeneous or dynamic treatment effects. Uh, this can occur quote unquote, bad comparisons uh, are given too much weight uh, in the two-way fixed effects estimate. Uh, and so we have, have run a good and vacant decomposition on our, on our treatment data. And it turns out that there is a significant amount of weight in the two-way fixed effects estimator that's given to these, these sorts of comparisons. Um, it's going to turn out that it's, it's, it's really uh, nothing too, too messed up going on. So uh, without further ado, let's see if we find anything uh, with these VILs. Uh, reducing teen drinking and smoking. So here I've got the estimates from the 1991 through 2019 extended sample. Uh, on the left pane here, we've got alcohol use. On the right pane, we've got cigarette use. Uh, in columns one and five, we start with just the state and year fixed effects, and then we gradually add controls as we move to the right. So two and six, we've got individual demographic controls. Three and seven, we've got the baseline state controls, and then four and eight, we've got the expanded state controls. Um, this is pretty indicative of a null result. We see almost no evidence, uh, no statistically significant evidence, no economically significant evidence of a negative relationship between these VILs uh, and these uh, underage alcohol use or cigarette use. In fact, we see estimated coefficients here in the kind of the bottom right-hand quadrant that are actually positive, although pretty imprecisely estimated. Moving on to event studies, again, we see no statistically significant evidence of a decline uh, in these behaviors due to the VIL. Um, these are not the tightest pre-trends right here, but still pretty tight and a pretty, a pretty flat event study here. 
And again, with the exception where we see this sort of strange positive uptick uh, on the cigarette use, which is certainly not a decline. Uh, and sorry, that was looking at the, uh, so that's the augmented YRBS from 1991, 2019. Uh, the results are gonna be largely the same in the national YRBS for the same period. So uh, we do see a little bit of a slight like upward tick here. Um, but it's it's not statistically distinguishable from zero. These are 95% confidence intervals. Uh, and we do see sort of a break in trend here uh, in the enactment and uh, one wave plus periods. And again, very flat here on cigarette use. Uh, maybe important to note that these uh, these X axes are in waves. So these are in two year, two year uh, wave periods. Right here, we see it again for the state, and again, no evidence of any negative relationship. Um, bringing in these Callaway Santana estimators just to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, having the the true effect be lost in this this uh, potentially biased to a fixed effects estimator. Uh, again, we're seeing very very flat, uh, no evidence of any negative relationship or you know any 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 decline in these behaviors due to the BIL. So then, okay, maybe we should look at intensive measures. And we still see nothing. So we've got the national at the top, state in the middle, and the augmented at the bottom again. And again, we see no evidence of a decline in any of these behaviors due to the BIL. Well, maybe there is some really specific uh, effect on males or females, like Mike mentioned. Um, and again, here we have this split up. Uh, so we've got all of our outcomes here, alcohol use, binge drinking, frequent binge drinking, smoking, everyday smoking, uh, split up by 16-year-old males, females, 16-year-old uh, non-Hispanic whites, uh, and then 16-year-old non-whites. And again, we see no, no statistically significant evidence that there's been any uh, effect of the VIL in reducing any of these behaviors in any of these specific groups uh, or you know, in these specific groups or just maybe one of these intensive measures. Uh, we're seeing a pretty, pretty, pretty standard null right across the board. Okay. Now, what about if we compare to some of the prior work? Uh, so here, uh, this is our replication of the Baloo and Bot paper uh, that we match their, uh, their magnitudes, their point estimates, and their significance. Uh, you know, our estimates are functionally identical. Uh, and then here we have the uh, augmented YRBS estimates from 2019 from a few slides ago. Uh, and here we actually have the note that these, uh, these estimates from the augmented YRBS are sufficiently precise that their 95% confidence intervals actually rule out the national YRBS estimates in the 2009 period uh, that we've replicated from Baloo and Bot, which is strange, or maybe not strange. So, here we can take a look at the identifying variation by sample. So the 1991 through 2009 national YRBS sample is on the left and the full augmented sample is on the right. So uh, you see on the left in the initial sample, we're missing a couple of key states like California, New York, uh, and some of, uh, we're missing the Carolinas and Tennessee down here as long as some of the Great Plains, Mountain West. Uh, and here on the augmented sample through 2019, uh, it's pretty much completely filled out where we've we're getting identifying variation from every state besides Minnesota, which was a, a late adopter and, and didn't contribute any data in 2019. Okay, so looking across all of the 2000, the 2009 samples, we've got uh, alcohol on the left, cigarettes on the right. Again, here's the initial, uh, the initial results that show this strong negative uh, relationship. Again, this is about a 10% decline uh, four percentage points for alcohol, three percentage points for cigarettes. And then we, we see pretty much nothing in either the state or the augmented YRBS uh, during the same period. We can look at the event studies. Here's the national YRBS event studies uh, through 2009. So we do see this break in pre-trend and then a, uh, a fairly sharp decline uh, in the in the post period here and here again a break in the a break in the trend and then a slight decline here in the post period. This is for the national, but for the state. So just switching over to the other survey, we again see no evidence of any uh, of any significant decline due to the VIL. 
this is going to beg the uh, beg the question is why are the results different? Uh, this is, you know, these are very divergent estimated treatment effects. Uh, and so now we want to try and solve this puzzle. Why, how can we explain this? So the first answer might be, well, what if there are these heterogeneous VIL treatment effects by state, right? So we've got the national YRBS, uh, the original sample on the left-hand side, and then the state YRBS for the same period on the right-hand side. And we see that uh, these are these graphs, these, these maps are almost complements of each other. So we see that uh, there's not not a ton of there's only some overlap in the amounts of states that are uh, that are contributing identifying variation in either of these samples. So it could be the case that each of uh, these different groups of states, right, states that contribute to the national YRBS and states that contribute to the state YRBS, maybe they have different treatment effects. And all we're doing is just documenting the divergent treatment effects by states. Okay. So that would be answer number one. Answer number two is maybe there's just measurement error in the national YRBS. We know that the state YRBS is designed to measure these state level trends, and we're talking about a state level policy here. So we, we have good reason to believe that the state YRBS is going to be a better measure uh, when trying to answer this question. So it could just be that, there's, that we're documenting measure error in the national YRBS. So to test this, we're going to restrict the sample to states that have identifying variation in both samples, right? So this one can be a little tough to explain, but here we're looking at the national YRBS and the state YRBS, the first and third columns, right? This is just uh, restricting to the, the, uh, uh, the states that contribute in both of these maps. So for instance, here, like Utah, New Mexico, uh, the deep South and Florida here, uh, and as well as like the, the Midwest here, right? So we're just restricting to those states in the first and third columns. Then in the second and fourth columns, we're going to further restrict to just the state, uh, to only, we're going to further restrict the states that have the overlap to only the years that have the overlap, right? So uh, the, the odd numbered columns are the same states and the even numbered columns are the same, sa same states at the same times. And for each of these, we're going to leave in uh, a common set of the non-adopters as the counterfactuals. And what we can see here is that, especially in the first three columns, we're going to see still huge divergences in the estimated treatment effects across the national and state YRBS. So this is highly indicative of measurement error, we think, because if, if we've, we've essentially ruled out the possibility of the, the heterogeneous treatment effects by state here, because we've conditioned, we're looking at the exact same sample of states across both surveys. So what else could it be in this case besides measurement error? And again, there's a little bit more confluence in the estimates here uh, in column four, but the, the, you know, kind of the preponderance of the evidence here is, is, is leading us to think that it's probably measurement error in the national YRBS. Um, and this is another great time to break for questions, I think. Okay, thank you, Russell. Um, first, we will um, take any comments from uh, our discussion. Um, and if you have any questions that you want to add to the Q&A, please do. Thanks. Uh, first question would be um, related to what C put in the chat, um, which is uh, the fact that you have this augmented sample that pools the national and state samples. Um, you know that that obviously increases sample size and uh, you know provides more treatment variation. But CDC does recommend against it. I think having something to do with um, person level weights being different, and also like there might be sample overlap where people might respondents might be in both, basically in both samples. And um, I think this is largely addressed by the fact that you're separately estimating the state and national data. But I'm, I'm curious about sort of like whether you think that the limitations in the augmented sample um, are a problem here. Yeah, so we do, we do reweight the sample when we put it together. So we, we leave the regular estimated, uh, the regular weights that we have in the state RBS, and then we uh, when we bring in the national YBS for the augmented sample, we do reweight them to account for that, especially because the sample sizes are so much smaller. Um, and sorry, what was the other? What was the other? What was the second part of your point? Uh, so it's the weights, but also there might be a, a respondent who's in both uh, both samples, which I think probably something that you can't identify directly in your data. Yeah, that's something that we can't identify. So I guess we're just going to have to 
to kind of chalk that up to we hope that that's not happening uh too extensively and if that is happening then we're going to hope that it's not correlated with the vil and we can just kind of consider that to right. be some unlucky measurement error but hopefully if it's not correlated with our treatment then i don't think it should be too much of a problem can yeah. i say quick can i say quick word please sure go ahead Joe. is that against your rules okay Joe. sorry Fine. no just because i've been through like a four rounds with jama sort of about this and uh and the cdc's sort of rules and i and i and i understand it right this is important you can't just use the national yrbs weights and the state yrbs weights and combine them in a pooled sample that would be wrong and you wouldn't get a, a state level and nationally representative estimates if you kind of blindly use the weight that are being provided. Uh, we discuss in the in the text in some detail how we reconstruct uh, the sample weights to to what we argue is uh, provide state level estimates that are representative of state trends and teen risky behaviors and also be at least nationally representative of 14 to 18 year olds. But we discuss methodologically how we do that. And we, we know there's a trade off. Our weights aren't per aren't perfect. We didn't design the survey. Our sample weights are aren't perfect. They're approximated. The advantage we get uh, is potentially greater uh, identifying variation, which I'm not sure the CDC or JAMA cares about, um, but we might sort of care about as 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 policy researchers. So there's a trade off to think about. And then this possible it's not been sort of demonstrated clearly how many uh, th this issue of sort of overlapping samples and the way the state and national YRBS are, are implemented. So in terms of best practices, I, I mean, I do think presenting estimates separately by the two data sets makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I do think there are important advantages for policy analysis that it is not blanket wrong uh, to combine the national and state YRBS to maximize policy variation when you carefully consider how to construct the, the weights. Sorry for my uh, 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 getting on a soapbox about it, but I strong. Views no, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you, you jumped in. Um, so one more thing on the, on the methods in terms of uh, choice of outcomes. So I, I guess I'd expect that vertical ID laws would, if anything, maybe affect ever use of alcohol or tobacco, um, whereas you're looking basically at not current use, um, you know, with the idea that, you know, a kid who can figure out how to get a hold of alcohol or tobacco once is you know more likely to be able to get it get access you know um, repeatedly and I'm wondering if that's something that you would be able to look at which would be you know obviously highly correlated with your measure but slightly different and uh, also whether you have data on number of cigarettes per day um, to look at uh, smoking intensity in that way um, as another alternative outcome. So I think we do have measures available on both of those. And I think that the, especially the SIGs per day, there must be a reason. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll think about the SIGs per day because I think that's that's a really good point. I, I think we also do have the ever use available. Um, I don't know if I necessarily think that that would give us too much of a difference. It also, I think when we're talking about ever use, that gives more uh, more room for ambiguity in the mechanism because ever use could just be you know, you just, someone gave you a puff of a cigarette or you, 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 you drank a beer at a party or had, had a sip of your dad's at dinner or something like that. But uh, that's, that's all, it's worth looking into for sure to see if, if anything pops up there. Okay. Um, so moving to your results, th this is something that you, I think you didn't really highlight as you were working through it, but the Coway Santana event studies in the state uh, sample seem to indicate that the vertical IDs, ID laws were increasing alcohol into in cigarette use, um, which, you know, seemed a little counterintuitive to me. Um, I, like, I, I, I guess I, I wouldn't understand why that would be the case. And in some cases, it's maybe not statistically significant, not, not in the augmented sample, but this, the state sample. Um, and yeah, it, it just, it, it raised questions for me about like whether the results could be driven by some other sort of time varying factor as uh, un unobservables that are, are sort of driving this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know if I would say that this is all like eyeball test, right? But yeah. we could see that there's maybe a slight upward free trend in the beginning. Uh, and then maybe we kind of just have to hang our hat on the fact that it's not statistically significant, although it is sort of marginally statistically significant at the end there. Um, I would say that this is leading a little bit more towards sort of inconclusive, but likely non-negative. Fair enough. Um, 
I, I guess relatedly uh, on your tests of the state level effect heterogeneity. Um, so when you're restricting the sample to states that were in both data set, both samples, um, I think you're running two way fixed effects rather than Kawe Santana. And I'm wondering like why, I guess why that's the case. And also sort of like, if you do use like one, one advantage of Kawe Santana is that you can also do these, um, you know, cohort specific effects. So looking at like state cohorts that implement at the same time. So like more directly look at this, the state heterogeneity. And I, I wonder if that's something that you explored too. So we did uh, capture the estimates from the Calway Santana, but we don't have them presented. So I think that that, uh, especially for this part of selling the paper would be a, a useful thing to, to put in there. Um, mostly we've been using the Calway Santana for its event studies, uh, but I think that you're right that it, it would be helpful to include the point estimates as well. Okay. I, I can hold other questions to the end. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Um, so, Russell, we have about nine minutes left, and we'd like to leave some time at the end for um, further uh, questions, comments. So, maybe if you have a few more minutes of uh, material you want to present for us, and then we will um, we'll do final comments and questions at that point. Yeah, great. Um, so, moving right along, we just have a few more slides here. Uh, really, we can now take a look at the mechanism exploration, right? So, we can look into whether or not. Uh, so, now we have data starting in 2007 on uh, students in the YRBS saying how they got their alcohol uh, the last time they drank. And so we've got uh, own purchase, meaning they bought it themselves, third party, meaning they you know, used an informal market, gave someone money to buy it for them. And then we have other, which is gonna include a lot of things like theft from family or stores, just being given it for free by others, buying it, on pardon me, buying it online, et cetera. Uh, and uh, again, we're still looking at own purchase here at the top. Remember that these means are the, the pretreatment means are, are still very, very small at two and a half percent of purchases uh, pretreatment. Uh, and we're not going to find any evidence that the VALs have, have shaken up any of these uh, mechanisms whatsoever. Uh, then, as far as like robustness or heterogeneity tests, um, we also have a triple difference model using a 17 and 18 year olds as a with, within state counterfactual. If anyone's interested in seeing that. Um, uh, that's going to reveal a similar pattern of results as the entire uh, study, right? So uh, pretty seemingly robust effects, seemingly strong effects in the uh, in the early national sample, and then these effects are going to dissipate in every other sample that we look at. Uh, and then we don't find any other, you know, significant negative results in the uh, time trend specifications, uh, any lagged effects on 17 or 18 year olds who were treated. Uh, we can put the samples all, the, all together uh, and weight accordingly and uh, find nothing. And then uh, we, we similar to, the, uh, to that 2001 Nest and Trust, the paper don't find any downstream effects on the, on the traffic fatalities in the, in the NHTSA's bars. So takeaways, we find little no evidence that these things have been uh, particularly effective. Uh, it's unlikely that they created some very significant uh, like public savings, uh, but they, they do seem like a common sense policy uh, it's not like we think that they should be repealed or anything like that, uh, but we, sh we shouldn't expect VILs or, or other policies like this moving forward that operate in these very specific narrow mechanisms to have these sorts of uh, groundbreaking effects. Um, and then econometrically, uh, at least for us, it's been a, an interesting and worthwhile exercise in how uh, different surveys can sort of mismeasure uh, uh, or misattribute the success uh, of a, a, a policy that's, that's adopted gradually. Uh, and then for, for further study, uh, I think looking into some of these uh, sharp cutoffs and uh, whether or not states expire and testing the interactions of that with the VIL, I think would be very fruitful for, for kind of putting the nail in this. Um, and, th and that's all. So uh, any, any further questions, happy to answer. Okay, thank you again. We will let um, uh, uh, Justin White uh, provide any uh, discussion comments. And if you have any final uh, questions or comments you would like to leave with the presenters, please add it to the Q&A. Yeah, I, I did want to mention um, we had a previous TOPS presentation by Erica Ntenga, um, who presented a paper that she has with Mike Pesco, also mm -hmm. on um, vertical ID laws. Um, and, and so I, I think that was last year. They, they're used, they I think, used uh, a couple different uh, survey data sets that are different from yours, also used a stack uh, diff and diff, so a slightly different estimator but also found no effects, which I think um, of the vertical ID laws, which I, I think also is, um, you know, somewhat validates uh, your pretty convincing findings that there, there, there's no effect here. 
Um, you know, one nice addition, I think, in your paper is that you're able to explore mechanisms a little bit more with usual sources. But uh, if you haven't looked at that paper, you know, I, I, I would recommend that you do. And I'd also give you a chance, I don't know if you have other comments about sort of points of similarity or difference um, between that paper and yours. Yeah, I actually, I, I need to look into that paper. I, I haven't seen it. Okay, v very good. Um, so to your point, I, I guess, uh, on um, how different surveys can lead to different results, I, I think that's a really important one for the literature. And I think just one, I, I guess I just want to reinforce that it does suggest, you know, that we should be testing robustness of findings in multiple data sets where that's possible. And so I, so I think that that's just like a, a really important takeaway um, from your study. I, I don't know if you have other things that you would add to that. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 really important. And I mean, you bring it up when you bring up uh, Mike Mike's paper. So it's obviously uh, we should be doing more work to look at other data sources ourselves and, and kind of take our own take a little bit of our own advice there. So yeah, I, I think it's it's super important. Yeah, and and final thing would be just to pin down the measurement error issue, which I think is sort of what you're attributing the main difference to being. Mm -hmm. Is that because of the sample size or is that uh, because of the, the survey design being different that, that it is national and not meant to be used for state policy very uh, yeah I think we're gonna situation. we're gonna attribute it more to the survey design uh, and there we're gonna say that the uh, the additional like much larger ends are also very helpful uh, but but mostly the survey design okay, great um, that's it for me Mike thanks so much uh, Russ great presentation yeah thanks great. so much for your comments Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Um, I see that uh, Joe is responding to one of the two remaining uh, questions in the Q and A. One new one just popped up, so we'll read that one, and then uh, this will be the last the last one we have time for. Um, for the mechanism where potential of age people have vertical IDs, which leads to higher uh, scrutiny for an underage person who is borrowing the ID, this would take several years to happen for someone who has who was 16 at the time of implementation to now be over 21, right? Question mark. I wonder if this would come out with additional policy lakes. Yeah, so I think uh, the additional, so yes, you're right. It, it is true that if someone was issued a vertical ID at 16, it would take five years for them to be able to pass on that vertical ID. Um, I think that we should view, uh, when you talk about policy links, I think we should view this as a potential weakness of some of the, the policies in states where there's not a sharp cutoff, right? So there would be a delay in this, but in an ideal world, this policy would be at its strongest when that vertical ID just uh, expired when the, the holder turned 21 and wasn't able to, to pass it on to, to a younger peer. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Um, it looks like the Q&A is now cleared. Uh, thanks for the great uh, conversation, uh, audience members. And I'm gonna turn it over to our MC to take us out the door. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 125 people for your participation. If you're interested in presenting for our next season, please consider submitting a brief presentation proposal uh, in our website, uh, tobaccopolicy.org, by June 5th. TOPS will resume with a new season in a few weeks. You can also visit our website to subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already to ensure you will be notified about next season's opening presentations. Have a TOPS Notch weekend.